I'm Liam. Uh, um, I'm, for, I'm at Kingston University doing a, um, a PhD, just finishing it up, working on Kant mainly. May it was a way into Kant. And with that in mind, my response comes from the perspective of Kant, by going back to Kant, as they say, to provide not quite a rejoinder to the developments discussed over the past three days, but rather ask if thinking from the position of Kant raises any, any questions what has been done. And the issue I want to pick up in Kant is not in the details of the transcendental, analytic, aesthetical logic, you know, not how the mere understanding of the, the mere analytic of the pure understanding, which is the modest aim of the critique that Kant puts forward, um, not how it's developed since Kant's time um, and is augmented by developments in sciences. Rather, I quickly want to look at the section of the critique that has not been addressed so much, the transcendental dialectic. And this perhaps fits with the initial caricature that Fabio gave of the, in the introduction, that continental philosophy is more concerned with some of the aims of the dialectic rather than the analytic, um, or, or at least the limits developed in the dialectic and the themes of finitude and ends that resulted. And my response is a brief sort of problematization of limits. But the dialectic is also important because it's the part of the critique where Kant directly addresses and rejects dogmatic metaphysics. And this is the part of Kant that Mayer so explicitly endorses. As Muhanna said this morning, and Taylor evoked the argument that Mayer Su could just be a, a dogmatist, and Dionysus talked about intellectual intuition. Um, Mayer Su notes that, and I quote him, we cannot go back to being metaphysicians just as we cannot go back to being dogmatists. On this point, we cannot but be heirs of Kantianism. So let's look at what we're actually heirs of. Um, I mean, Mayer who identifies two elements of the rejection of dogmatism, the rejection of the principle of sufficient reason and of the ontological argument for God. And I think it's really interesting that Mayer who identifies this as with the critique, but Kant actually was working on this well before the critique. So in the New Elucidation in 1755, he's concerned with the principle of sufficient reason. Um, in the only possible argument in support of the existence of God in 1763, he's taught, he rejects the ontological argument there. But he still, there was still a trace of dogmatism in his thought that he didn't quite get rid of until the critique. So the development of him is, is a, bit more, a bit more subtle. But the dialectic is Kant's systematic working out of the problems of dogmatism and its rejection. But it's not wholly negative and refu refutative. It also contains Kant's account of what happens beyond the bounds of legitimate cognition as reason leads the understanding off its secure grounds, the secure grounds established in the analytic. And this is an important point. For Kant both sets the boundary of what he calls objective cognition, thus its finitude, but he does so by identifying something beyond that boundary. And in section 57 of the Prolegomena, Kant explicitly makes a distinction between limits and boundaries, between Schranken and Grenzen, where limits are purely negative, but boundaries, and I quote him, always presuppose a space that is found outside a, a certain fixed location and that encloses at that location. Objective cognition as schematized intuition is bounded rather than limited. And Kant uses metaphors like the boundary stones um, or the famous the island of truth that's surrounded by seas of fog and, and delusion. So there is a sea beyond the boundary of the island. And the dialectic is, is him. He says Hume is happy to be shipwrecked on a barren rock and, and just stay there, but, but Kant has to set off onto the sea to find the boundary of the island from the outside. Um, he also makes a space outside of objective cognition obvious in his preface to the B edition, where he writes that he, quote, had to deny knowledge in order to make room for faith. And um, Jim O'Shea commented on practical reason, you know, as this is what's going on in this room beyond, beyond knowledge, where knowledge is denied. And I think this space beyond Beyond knowledge is, also, is perhaps the K-space in which Gabriel was talking, where the movement is possible to look back and identify these, keep moving into other spaces, so to speak. So in this way, I think Kant is not quite as strict as the characterization of him that um, Badiou puts forward and that Fabio quoted, as a watchman whose gaze you cannot escape. It's possible to get beyond the boundaries of cognition. You know? So he recognizes that they're there, and he, yeah, he watches them, but, but you can go beyond it. And indeed, reason leads the understanding via a, quote, natural and unavoidable illusion beyond those boundaries. 
So reason itself naturally goes there. And that, that transgression of the boundaries is not eliminated by the dialectic, but only identified in order to determine the boundary of legitimate cognition from the outside to navigate the island of the truth, from, from on the sea as well as on the land. So this space beyond the boundaries of objective cognition is important in confronting the characterization of Kant in terms of finitude. Kant still has some room to move, so to speak, beyond the contingency of the categories. Kant does not eliminate all speculation or the pretensions of reason. In fact, he uses the necessity of such speculation in identifying at least the boundaries of cognition. And I say at least the boundaries of cognition for the question now shifts to the possibility of the boundaries or the limits of reason and, and what's going on there. And it's in that idea, that's what I want to put forward for discussion or clarification. Because the dialectic not only criticizes and rejects dogmatism, but it reformulates the postulates of dogmatism as illusions and into regulative ideas that are an important part of the progression and development of science. And science is revisable, again, as Jim pointed out in the dialectic, in the appendix to the dialectic, this is where Kant puts forward this idea. But the importance of regulative ideas, even within any uh, augmentations of the a priori since Kant, the relativized a priori, etc., has been brought up by several speakers. So Fabio and Jim mentioned a regulative ideal of an expl explanatory complete conceptual framework, and this was in relation to Peirce. Um, the regulative principles came up in the discussion of Ray's talk. Um, what I took from my notes was something like Kant's regulative ideals are a truth about empiricism that allows reason's reflective capacities. So room to look back, so to speak. Um, Peirce was mentioned again there, and the hinging propositions, although I'm not quite sure they're the same as regulative ideas. I think there's something different. So it's a common theme that's come up um, along, but has sort of been unarticulated too much. Of them. So to frame my invitation for discussion, I want to quickly look at the dialectic again which combines the criticisms of dogmatism as rationalist psychology, cosmology, and theology um, with the construction of the regulative ideas of the soul, the world, and God. And regulative ideas in terms of the focus imaginarius, which was a term that Ken used this morning in relation to um, consensus and standards. But, I mean, it was only briefly mentioned. But Kant talks, it uses this image of the focus imaginarius. And this is where there's a connection between the analytic and the dialectic and Kant's perhaps illegitimate systematicity. I mean, it's illegitimate insofar as he violates it immediately. For his analysis of dogmatism is grounded on the categories of relation, and this is his violation, it's not the entire table of categories, it's just the categories of relation. I think perhaps the categories of relation are the really important ones, because they're also there for the analogies as well, and there's evidence in the reflexion that Kant wanted. His initial sketch of the categories was just the categories of relation. So the categories of relation, inheritance and subsistence, causality and dependence, and community are analysed via three forms of the syllogism that they use, categorical, hypothetical, and disjunctive, and they lead to the soul, world, and God in the paralogisms, antinomy, and ideal. So it's a really like systematic connection of them. Um, so Kant closely ties the categories not only to his rejection of dogmatism, but also to his account of the progress of knowledge its revisability and its regulation, and its illusory aim and its infinite task. Um, so he identifies the transcendental ideas not as things in themselves that can be reached or discovered, that would be dogmatism, but as the focus imaginarius that, um, that they go towards. And this is, um, I think, when Pete was talking about Plato and justice this morning, this is the distinction between them. Justice is not something we come to. It's rather an ideal that we progress before, that, towards, that we can never reach. Um, and Plato was right to a degree. The ideas are ideas, but it's precisely because they're ideas that they will never be real empirical things or objects, etc. But th that does not mean they're not useful for the progression of knowledge. And this is the whole as-if structure. We treat them as if we could reach them, so we keep striving towards them. So the question I would pose, given all the work done over the last three days, and which I see as part, um, I see the work largely concerned with the analytic of the understanding and how that, the details of it, how it's developed, the renegotiation of the categories or the forms of intuition. 
Um, so I ask, if we develop a naturalized Kantianism with a different set of the relativized a priori, then what does that mean for the attempt to preserve a relation between the analytic and the dialectic? And what regulative transcendental ideas do we have to pose beyond the in this space beyond the boundaries of cognition for the adjustment of the categories or the transcendental? What, what are these regulative ideas and how are they tied to what we renegotiate of the analytic? And so that's the question I pose and I'll end there. Introduce myself. Um, I'm Anke Breunig. I work at the University of Halle in Germany and I am writing my, my PhD on Seller. So, in our little group of respondents, I'm the Seller's person. <laughs> um, all right, and I have like a very minimal presentation here. Um, I'm going to touch quite briefly on these four points. Um, I'm going first to talk a little bit about the myth of the given. Uh, then I'll suggest a parallel between uh, Sabbath's rejection of the given and uh, Kant's critique of dogmatism, but I won't dwell on it just as a general suggestion. Um, then I'll uh, come to topics that have been discussed quite a lot on, in the last few days, like um, moving that Sellers, in a way, moves beyond Kant in introducing our relativized th synthetic a priori. Um, and then finally, I'll have a p few, a little bit more critical remarks on the uh, dynamics between the manifest and the scientific image and the, um, the hope to ultimately uh, reach the ideal of a Persian science. So, okay. Um, I'll start with a question which I take to be like maybe the one question with, which has been a concern of all the speakers or mo most of the speakers, um, and that is the, the, the this term correlationism and uh, what do, what does one understand? Uh, what is a correlationist, and in particular? Now, is Sellers a correlationist? And um, I am going to focus on this question as Sellers in the same boat as Kahn concerning that question. So, whether or not one accepts Mayer Sue's uh, attack on uh, Kahn, I'm not going to decide. It's just my question uh, how does Sellers uh, stand here? So, um, and I think it is interesting to, to introduce uh, Seller's attack on the given in that regard, um, which maybe has not, it, it has always been mentioned, but uh, maybe it has not been uh, addressed in, in great detail here. So, um, and I think it brings to the front that Seller's also approaches this problem from from a very uh, from epistemological considerations from an epistemological perspective. So that is one uh, thing I think which relates to to Pete's distinction and to Pete's Pete's question. Um, okay. So to address the I think the myth of the given is very. Um, important to understand Seller's relation to Kahn. So Seller's first uh, de uh, develops uh, his attack on the given in empiricism and the philosophy of mind. Um, but then he, and then he writes uh, Science and Metaphysics and then he says something, oh, this book should make explicit the Kantian orientation, which was only implicit in empiricism and the philosophy of mind. 
So um, he takes Kant in a way to have anticipated his uh, critique of givenness. Um, and that he does in, in uh, the opening remarks of the first chapter of Science and Metaphysics, where he um, draws attention to Kant's contrasts between concepts and intuitions, and uh, says that uh, Kant has a very important insight here in his doctrine that we all always need to put them together, that we need these two stems of knowledge in order to, uh, in order to have knowledge. Yeah. Um, here Ben also goes on to criticize uh, the way in which Kant exactly draws that distinction, but I'm not going to go into that. Um, so what's the idea behind this? I think um, one can say that in rejecting givenness, Salois uh, rejects that we can have immediate cognitive access to the world or to some features of the world um, as it really is. Um, and and Salius says against this that we need a, that we always need to approach the world with a conceptual frame, a conceptual picture already in place. Um, so here's like one quote which I take to be, which is very important to me. I think it's very um, revelatory about uh, what's the idea behind these different versions of the myth of the given, which Salas distinguishes, and so, and also how this idea relates to something in Khan. So I'm going to read this according. That is a quote from. Um, Kant's theory of experience. Um, so it's according to the above interpretation, the representings that are brought about by the affection of receptivity would, as intuitions, already be in a broad sense conceptual. To make this move, however, is to give a radical reinterpretation of the concept of receptivity and to the contrast between receptivity and spontaneity. So that's what that relates immediately to the beginning of uh, science and metaphysics um, and the con contrast between concepts and intuitions. And then Solos goes on in uh, filling this idea up with his own uh, conception of the language entry transition. And he says, uh, this can be brought out by comparing Kant's conception of the affection of receptivity by things in themselves with what I have, as we call, language entry transitions. A language entry transition is an evoking, for example, of the response, this is read by a red object in sunlight from a person who knows the language to which the sentence belongs. So that is very important, that the person who responds already knows the language, already has that conceptual scheme. Um, as an element in a rule given linguistic system, the utterance is no mere condition for response to the environment. Its occurrence is a function not only of the environment, but of the conceptual set of the perceiver. To know the language of perceptions, to be in a position to let one's thoughts be guided by the world in a way that contrasts with free association, with daydreaming, and more interestingly, with the coherent, coherent imagining of the storyteller. Okay, um, yes, I think, so, so, well, just one quick remark. I think what this quote also shows kind of uh, beautiful is that uh, language entry transitions uh, for sellers are not just causal dispositions, that they already um, are, like, conceptually laden and normatively laden. Um, and that maybe relates to a point Pete has also brought up. Um, Brenham employs this term, RDRDs, reliable differential responsive dispositions. Um, and I don't think that la service language entry transitions are just that. 
So, uh, um, but okay. So here's like in uh, <laughs> very rough terms, a picture of Salva's uh, attack on the given. But this one can say raises the familiar worry: um, Do we have access to the world as it is in a, in itself, or? Um, is it somehow that we make the world up in a way that's already, that we bring our own concepts to the world? Um, so, so I think one can, in a way, take it that Salva's attack on the given commits him uh, to a view that faces very similar problems than Kant's own view. Mm. Okay, and now I come, well, j just one remark on point two. Um, I think it is interesting to compare Seller's uh, attack on the given uh, with Kant's rejection of dogmatism, dogmatism and uh, one can in a way say that Seller's also engaged in a, a critical project, the critical undertaking here. Although there are certain differences, like um, Seller's attack is primarily, though not exclusively, directed against empiricism. Um, Kant's critique of uh, dogmatic me metaphysics is mainly primarily directed against the rationalists, although I think one can give a twist to Kant's critique as well. So it's, it's a critique of empiricism, too. Um, and that, well, maybe that's just for the discussion. Uh, Liam has just brought up this uh, critique of dogmatism and Kant. Maybe we can relate uh, these points here. OK, so um, a move uh, beyond Kant, point three, uh, Sellers introduces the relativized syn synthetic at a priori, a priori, and um, well, it's just that move that for Sellers the categories are not absolute; they are relative. They can be revised, so there can be like different competing conceptual schemes, which differ also in their uh, in their. Uh, Categorical structure. Um, and he also does something, well, I take him to do something which may be a bit more controversial. Um, I think he makes no very big difference between the categories as very abstract concepts and certain less abstract general concepts. He, uh, it's kind of it's not that the categories are in no way empirically in form, uh, purely a priori, um, even if we have to assume that they are a priori, a priori uh, with, with, with respect to a particular conceptual scheme. So I think uh, it's, it's quite interesting what, what Sellers is doing here, and I, in a way I disagree with uh, Dionysus' point um, about there being a very um, big difference between the category, between the categories as concepts and certain other uh, more empirically lone uh, general concepts. Um, but then can one can say, oh, if Sarah's uh, introduces that relative a priori, he is, um, well, he is just endorsing a kind of relativism. Uh, that seems to be a big danger. But I think um, that uh, critique of Sellers wouldn't really get any hold, because in a way, I think by introducing the relative uh, relativized a priori, he's in a, in a way in a better position uh, then come to answer to certain, um, well, to that correlationist worry or to, to um, 
anti-realist worries. Um, and one, one thing I want to bring up again shortly is, um, well, he doesn't say conceptual schemes are just relative. He thinks we, we progress from one conceptual scheme to another in a rational way. So our schemes are getting better and better. Um, and the sciences uh, play an important role here. And I think one thing Sowers emph emphasizes is that the sciences are, um, play a very important role in conceptual uh, innovation and um, radicalize conceptual uh, change. <coughs> and that is a quote from Ray's talk. He, he had it on screen uh, from that uh, counterfactual dispositions and the cosmodalities paper. Um, and um, maybe I'll just read the beginning. Uh, it says, once the development of human language left the state where linguistic changes had causes but not reasons, and man acquired the, the ability to reason about his reasons, uh, then his language came to permit the formulation of certain propositions which, incapable of proof or disproof by empirical methods, draw in the heart of language, militant a picture of language triumphant. Um, that's a nice quote, um, but I, what I want to emphasize here is that, that um, this state where uh, conceptual change has uh, reasons, that's in a way, that's where the sciences come in. Or maybe it starts before, but with the sign, when, the, when we have the sciences, um, this whole conceptual dynamic um, gets uh, to a new level, raises to a new level. Mm. So I think uh, Salas does quite well with this whole picture of conceptual change. Um, but okay, then but then I come to I'm I'm not going doing very good on my time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so just very quick remarks on the, on, on the fourth, uh, fourth point, um, manifest versus scientific image. Um, I think the whole story I have told so far can still, in a way, um, happen within the manifest image, although I uh, emphasize the role of the, of the sciences in that last bit. Um, and I must say I'm quite um, skeptical and I'm one of the, I belong to these Salvagians who mm, I'm a bit <laughs> reluctant to engage with the process ontology and I mean I, I don't feel that I understand what Sellers doing there, um, but yeah, I I just want to make like this point on the on the scientific image that I mean, as the in our current situation, we have this clash between the, the images according to Sellers, the mani manifest and scientific image, um, and then we have to integrate them, and I think that's. That's a valuable thought, but as the scientific image is momentarily, it's in no better situation to reveal the world <laughs> as it really is to us than the manifest image. The, the scientific image is still an image um, that must go through this process of revision and uh, continuing conceptual change. Um, and then you can say, okay, but Salas has this conception of the Persian science, where science finally reaches a stage where it um, provides an adequate picture of the world. And 
I think that's also interesting that cells would not, or we wouldn't have to commit to the thought that we would actually reach that stage. It could be something very remote. Um, and yeah, well, this various topics uh, addressed in Mohanad's talk and in, in uh, Jim's uh, talk couldn't uh, can't couldn't sell us um, in a way or couldn't we with sellers rest content with some form of empirical realism and not be very pessimistic that this empirical realism implies some form of of transcendental ide idealism in a problematic way um, without um, buying this whole story about actually reaching a final stage of science. Okay, so maybe I just stop here. <laughs> Uh, is the microphone working or can I use uh, it? Hello. Test, test, test. No, nothing? It is. It is? Okay, sure. All right, so I'm uh, Sibrin. <laughs> uh, I do a PhD in uh, Leuven and I work mainly on random um, free will and moral responsibility. Um, so the general story I want to shed light on concerns the role played by correlationism, Mersu's term for his uh, self-constructed uh, opponent. The last three days, some speakers have objected to the lack of a clear definition of the term in after finitudes, and whether this definition is indeed lacking, whether or not there is a plurality of incompatible definitions um, of correlationism, whether or not we agree whether the quasi-definitions may also give live up to your expectations or not, uh, do think that there is something fundamentally wrong or at least something highly ironic about his use of the term correlationism. So my two specific questions will follow from this more general story and I will be specifically uh, address them to Taylor and uh, Ray. So, um, nevertheless, I take the general story to be relevant uh, to all speakers, um, so let me start by explaining um, what this general story is about. So Meyasu argues that correlationism is a position that, I quote, consists in disqualifying the claim that it is possible to concern the realms of subjectivity and objectivity independently of one another. Um, so his most general claim is that correlationism blocks epistemic access to things in themselves. It has lost access to the great outdoors, etc. So, hence the need for Meassu's, uh, for Meassu to overcome correlationism. Now, what I want to emphasize is what I call a therapeutic strand in many of the correlationist uh, philosophies uh, Meassu criticizes. This um, therapeutic methodology consists in, first, an uncovering of the underlying semantic assumptions of skepticism concerning genuine knowledge of things in themselves, and secondly, a critique of this uh, mistaken underlying um, semantics. Um, so the aim of the correlationist is in this sense to exactly dissolve the skeptic's questions uh, rather than accepting it as a well-posed question and giving a negative answer to it. So ironically, contrary to uh, what Mea Su says, it is such a um, anti-skeptical therapeutic dissolving, or so I argue, that lies at the heart of some of the most uh, brilliant uh, correlationist moves in the history of philosophy. Um, so instead of not allowing us to give a positive answer to the question concerning things in themselves, the correlationist uh, main strategy consists in showing um, the question to be unintelligible. So the most famous adherent to such a therapeutic methodology is of course the late Wittgenstein. However, it is present in the works of Heidegger and Hegel as well. Heidegger, for example, uh, famously claimed explicitly against Kant that the scandal of philosophy is not that the question concerning the existence of a mind independent world has not yet been answered, but that the question still, get asked, uh, still gets asked again and again. Um, 
one of Heidegger's main motivations to introduce the primacy of the correlation in his being in the world uh, is exactly because he takes the skeptic's question to be a symptom of a mistaken subject-object divide that underlies uh, the question in the first place. Uh, so in this context, I would like to address my first specific question to Taylor, um, because it appeared to me that it was maybe a bit too charitable to uh, Measu by falling back to the strong correlationist position as Measu defined it, uh, in a way of being enabled to know and even think uh, things in themselves. So it seems to me that Heidegger would take the question concerning knowledge of things in themselves to be a symptom of a problematic dualist subject-object metaphysics, uh, exactly the metaphysic metaphysics he criticizes in, um, uh, in being in time. Um, so I would like to know what uh, you, Taylor, um, uh, make of this quote um, um, and what you make of this, what I call a therapeutic strand in Heidegger. Um, so wouldn't he say that correlationism, that is the correlationist intertwining of the subjective and the objective, is exactly the cure for the skeptic's problem rather than, as Measu says, that it blocks access to it? So I think Heidegger has, has, has much stronger anti-skeptical tools than the ones um, that were used in the presentation. Um, I don't think that the Heidegger of being in time would say that there is an outside that is unthinkable and might be wholly other. Rather, I take him to argue that the skeptic's question cannot be meaningfully articulated uh, in the first place. Um, so I'd, I'd just like to know what you would okay, have to say. No, 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 no. Okay. A later thing. Okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, of course, a uh, similar anti skeptical strategy is pursued by Hegel in his Phenomenology of Spirit. Um, and in his yet unpublished major work on Hegel uh, of Brandom, uh, A Spirit of Trust, which is online accessible, um, Brandom dedicates his first three chapters to Hegel's anti skeptical strategy. Um, in uh, Hegel's introduction to the phenomenology of spirit. And Brandom exactly takes Hegel to criticize the underlining representationalist semantics um, of skepticism concerning knowledge of things in themselves. Uh, and more specifically, he criticizes what Brandom calls a two-stage representationalism that allows for a gap between, at the one side, conceptually articulated representations in Kantian normative terms in the Cartin as immediately accessible subjective representations and on the other side, a non-conceptual world. Um, so he argues as long as this intelligibility gap uh, is allowed for, um, Brandom's uh, Hegel argues, skepticism about things in themselves is an unavoidable consequence. Uh, so the argument that Brandom's Hegel pursues is that this, is, um, that this semantic assumption that lies at the root of the problem should be overcome. So in order for genuine knowledge of things in themselves to be possible, one must understand the world itself as conceptually articulated, which in uh, random is in terms of material incompatibilities and consequences, which he takes to be the successor of Hegel's uh, notion of determinate negation. So it's, it's only then that the world itself can exert a rational constraint on our empirical beliefs, and the result is a conceptual and modal realism uh, which replaces the uh, representationalist semantics that according to um, Hegel's and Brandom's therapeutic diagnosis uh, lies at the root of the skeptics problem in the first place. Okay. Yeah, due to the limited time I have, I have to go to, uh, uh, to all of this very quickly, but I uh, would like to use this Hegelian background um, to ask my second question um, to Ray. Um, because you said that you did not want to um, bash or criticize Measu too much with uh, Seller's modal expressivism, um, but it seems to me that there is a very obvious way uh, of criticizing Measu's modal thesis if one accepts the expressivist uh, Kant Seller's uh, thesis. So the critique would consist in the fact that Measu treats modal vocabulary as a descriptive kind of uh, vocabulary whereas this in Sellers and Kant's framework um, would amount to a category mistake, uh, or as Wittgenstein would call it, a, gramma a grammatical mistake. Um, so Measu's answer to Hume's problem consists in turning our inability to, um, our inability to know that there are necessary connections between two succeeding events in the ontological truth, um, that there are no necessary connections, but what he shares with his opponent, who claims that there are necessary connections in the world, is that necessity is either something objectively present in the world or something objectively absent in the world. 
Uh, but these two options presuppose that modal vocabulary is descriptive. It describes something real uh, in the world. So I, I would think that the obvious way for Sellers uh, and Kant would be to say that uh, modal vocabulary, as Brandon puts it, has an expressive function um, which makes ex explicit what we implicitly have to do to describe something rather than having a descriptive function. Um, um, so in other words, uh, it is a condition of possibility for describing something rather than merely labeling it that one grasps a whole range of modal claims which are implicit in our everyday empirical descriptions. So my question is, uh, would you endorse such a grammatical critique um, of Measu, that is an argument uh, that he misunderstands the role of modal vocabulary, and wouldn't be the critique similar to Wittgenstein's mysterious talk about pain sensations that is not a something um, but not a nothing either. One just has to reject a descriptive grammar uh, that forces itself uh, upon us too easily. So isn't a problem with Measu from such an expressivist uh, perspective his underlying representationalist semantics, that is the idea that modal vocabulary represents something um, rather than expresses what we implicitly have to do in order to describe something. Now, uh, I, there's the last thing I'm going to say. Um, next to this, I, I wanted to make it a little bit more interesting because I think you would say yes. Um, and then, because if we endorse um, the Kant Sellers uh, modal expressivism, one still has to deal with the Hegelian modal realism. Um, uh, which Brandom's Hegel takes to be necessary in order to, uh, for genuine knowledge uh, of things in themselves to be possible. Um, so I want to ask whether you stop at the modal expressivism or if you continue to um, Hegel's, Brandom's um, modal realism. Um, and of course, I would like to know um, what your arguments would be uh, against the other position if you're a modal expressivist against modal realism and vice versa. So. So, well, thanks, Fabio, all the speakers, and everybody for um, two very interesting and thought-provoking um, two days and a half. So, um, so my name is uh, Clémence. I'm an Enfield student in Paris, in Panthéon Sorbonne, in uh, in Paris, um, and uh, I work on on Merleau Ponty. So the 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 strong uh, correlationist by excellence and uh, the uh, absolutizer of the correlation, uh, in particular with the, the concept of the flesh, which doesn't, uh, which, which, which in spite of it all makes me very sympathetic to um, um, speculative um, realism. Uh, hence perhaps why uh, Fabio originally asked me to uh, talk or at least mention uh, for this uh, response. Um, Dan Zahavi's recent um, response um, to, well, m speculative realism, but in, in particular, I guess, to uh, Tom Sparrow's book, The, the End of Phenomenology. Uh, however, even though I will uh, use uh, Zahavi um, as, as, a, as a starting point, I won't linger uh, too much, because if, you, if you've read or... or um, went through the, 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 the paper a little bit. Um, the, 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 let's say the, the, the polemical, um, highly polemical tone uh, of it unfortunately takes over um, interesting criticisms that could have been um, more layered and, and could have been lingered upon, especially with regards to uh, ongoing and particularly um, complicated debate within phenomenology with regards to questions of uh, realism, but also more recently the question of its um, naturalization. Uh, so, if I just um, 
just summarize uh, the, the three uh, main negative critiques that um, Zahavi expounds against um, speculative realism. It goes as, well, I, I guess that most of you would be familiar with these, uh, too superficial, simplistic, lacks novelty. And then he goes on uh, expounding more uh, positive critiques, but who, who sounds simply less negative, um, which are basically uh, to say that uh, they should, well, speculative realists, uh, even though he says that there are no unified um, uh, and clear, coherent position under, under that, that label, uh, should perhaps um, go back to analytic philosophy to use realist credential. I think that I won't spend too much time on that because it's been proven over the past three days that uh, something that's been uh, done uh, in very rigorous fashion. Uh, that is epistemologically underdetermined that I find perhaps more interesting. And um, finally, that it lacks co coherent commitments, but that's uh, an issue I want I want um, a, t a talk about. And he ends the paper on insisting that whereas we cannot tell the future of uh, speculative realism or speculative materialism, um, phenomenology is proven to uh, have had a continuing influence on um, mostly social, social sciences. Um, now what is interesting uh, in uh, Zahavi's paper, especially with regards to the question of the epistemological indetermination of uh, phenomenology is that it's not absolutely uh, obvious uh, that Husserl's project carried a, a clear um, a, cl a clear epistemological uh, project, uh, even though it is uh, absolutely undeniable that, um, or at least I, I would see with great difficulty how one could uh, defend Husserl against the accusation of, of uh, correlation. Uh, if we take that quote from the crisis, but one could go back as far as back as the, the, the logical uh, investigation, Husserl claims that Ordinarily, we notice nothing in the whole subjective character of the manner of exhibiting of the things, but in reflection, we recognize with astonishment that essential correlations obtained here, which are the component part of a farther reaching universal a priori, which has led, uh, and that is something that is for directly uh, relevant to, I think, the debates that have uh, taken place over the past two days and a half. Um, the link between correlationism and um, transcendentalism, or at least the transcendental as the kind of operative field that would um, unify, or at least, yeah, be the, 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 the kind of field in which different forms of correlationism, whether weak or strong or whatever, could uh, be in dialogue um, when, with one another. And um, actually what has, uh, well, what was striking uh, for me in this regard is that if at least one takes um, um, phenomenology and, and takes Meyasu's critiques to be mostly a critique of uh, Husserl's as, as being a, a transcendental idealist, uh, it's not uh, solely correlationism that is at stake, but correlationism, quite um, transcendentalism, that is put into into questions. Which, uh, therefore, um, whether one is a committed phenomenologist or not, um, that presents a danger that's, I suppose, be be, be taken seriously. Um, so, in regards to that, uh, Catherine Malabouf rather recent article, Can We Relinquish the Transcendental, uh, takes uh, upon uh, ourselves to uh, ask that question rigorously and questions the philosophical, well, the, 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 the tree that she identifies as being a strong uh, correlationist, namely Heidegger, Derrida, and Foucault, to basically expound um, or present two positions 
um, with regards, well, in continental philosophy, with regards to the, the criticisms brought about by continental, um, by, by continental realism, by uh, speculative realism, uh, namely a position uh, that would be embodied by Heidegger, Derrida, and Foucault uh, that consists of simply uh, relinquishing the, the transcendental, uh, that is to say, breaking with it, but ne negotiating um, that break, and argues that uh, what is actually uh, Meyasu's aim is not to relinquish um, transcendentalism, uh, qua correlationism, qua post phenomenology, and, and phenomenology, I suppose, uh, as well, uh, but to entirely uh, be, be done with it. Uh, that is to say, uh, for uh, her again, that it would uh, consist in um, getting real, uh, getting rid, sorry, of the possibility of synthesis as, uh, for example, the synthesis of adumbrations, the question of horizons, and potentially also relinquishing a certain conception that phenomenology has of the world as being in the world or uh, world for us and not world in itself. Uh, but also, uh, and second point, uh, abolishing the intimate relation that uh, continental philosophy holds to uh, be really important between thinking and, and, and being. Um, so the two, the two problems, I suppose, that I, I took very uh, seriously myself when I started reading Megasu and also asking, well, wondering about the framing of the questions regarding the naturalization of our well, yeah, or the impossible framing of the question considering the naturalization of phenomenology uh, was, of course, this idea of the expropriation of, of, of subjectivity from Meyasu's picture, um, but also the reframing of the question of, of uh, an alterity that would not be uh, an alterity uh, for us. And about that, I was actually... Uh, really, really interested that um, about, well, what uh, the Muhammad, uh, Muhammad's mention uh, this morning of the book uh, Science Fiction et Fiction des Sciences en Monde. Uh, I can't remember the English title, but it's this uh, it, ex extero, extero science fiction uh, yeah, uh, book who uh, what w one could say playfully uh, initiates some sort of uh, uh, imaginative free variations with regards how uh, consciousness and words would be uh, one without the other, or at least, sorry, uh, the whether whether uh, a world without uh, necessary laws uh, would imply uh, the abolition of consciousness, or whether there would still be like natural, well, nominal, uh, nominological, sorry, chaos without the. The, the persistence of some sort of consciousness and all these different uh, articulations, which I actually find uh, uh, in hindsight quite surprising that phenomenology did, did not uh, ask, uh, which actually brings me, and that would be recalled in the, the set of questions that I'm going to lay out at the end of this presentation, um, actually how much um, uh, phenomenology is interested in not only uh, epistemology but also uh, interested in, in, in ontological questions regarding uh, these, these aspects. Um, so, yeah, so uh, just to quote um, Meryl Ponty, for Kant, if our representation of the world were not governed by necessary connection, which he calls the categorism on which the principle of causality, the world would be nothing but a, <laughs> but a disordered mass of confused perception incapable of yielding the experience of a unified consciousness. So I think that yeah, this idea of yielding the experience of a unified consciousness that is never even thought of or put into questions uh, in, in phenomenology, not even, I think, with Usul, is something that I find really, really important. And, well, the, 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 the whole talk about phenomenology there is not just because I can only but talk about that, although that's, that's partly uh, my, my issue, um, is uh, because I thought that um, even with regards to uh, questions surrounding the transcendental or 
transcendentalism at large. Okay, I don't know your password. Um, it's it's something that yeah um, could bring, in my opinion, interesting lines of further for further discussion uh, after at the round table. So yeah, I will just uh, finish very very briefly with a, a playful dialogue uh, led out by uh, Malabu at the end of her article, where she <laughs> precisely uh, asked, "Can we?" Oh yeah, so like that. Then you need to look on this one. All right. OK. Um, so can we relinquish the transcendental? If transcendental means authentic, then not only can we relinquish the transcendental, but we have to. It also means, then, that we have to relinquish the transfinite, which is of an alterity that is only mathematically, poss uh, that is only mathematically possible, as uh, this appears as another form of authenticity and irreducibility. We definitely have to relinquish the, in, uh, the irreducible. Do you mean that nothing is irreducible, authentic, or unconditional? Yes, this is what I mean. Then can we remain continental philosophers if we open the door of the irreducibility to the anything? No. If we follow Heidegger, Derrida, Omeyasu, no. Yes, if we follow, well, if we follow Kant himself. Kant himself? Yes, Kant himself. The trajectory of the three critiques coincides with the most radical exposure of the transcendental to its own, uh, yeah, to its own destruction ever. When Kant deals with the living being in the second part of the critique of power of judging, he deals with the non-transcendental, which is something that refuses to be judged or thought, which is in need of its determination. He then comes to the conclusion that there are two types of necessities, mechanistic and Theological. The Kantian deconstruction of the transcendental pertains to this pluralization of necessity. What does life do to uh, sorry sorry? What does life do to thought to do? Oh, okay, yeah, to thought. Sorry. There are so many modifications of the universal transcendental natural concepts left unde undetermined by the low sorry laws given a priori, says Kant in the preface to the third critic. Life is what modifies the transcendental, what relinquishes it by forcing it into, in, to transform, uh, forcing it to transform itself. Sorry, sorry, it's very hard to read laterally. Um, to, to become plastic, you mean? Yes. We thus have to negotiate the relinquishing of the transcendental with, with Kant's own struggle with it. How then? Well, in exploring a field that is so often despised by the philosophers, we mentioned it, that of biology. In establishing that our categories are reducible to biological concepts, for example, yes, exactly. That the, uh, that the transcendental is in the brain, yes, exactly. Are you aware of being inauthentically Kantian when you say that? I am perfectly aware of it. I'm not certain that Kant would have rejected such an inauthentic approach to his philosophy. So yeah, I think that dialogue kind of summarizes um, using the stuff that I've been going on here um, in the past few days. So yeah, so basically, I would just end up with very, very, very vague and, and, and general and therefore embarrassing for me questions. But uh, just to come back to, to um, my very uh, short introduction, I really wanted to, to, to ask for clarifications or at least debate going on with regards to what are SR's commitment or purchase with regards to epistemology or ontology, that's a debate that's been going on, uh, whether Meyasu is more interesting actually in metaphysics than uh, answering uh, epistemological, uh, well, realist epist epistemological problems. Uh, similarly, uh, has phenomenologists any purchase or commitment to an ontology, an epistemology, or as Meyasu suggests, uh, does it finally end up uh, in some sort of mysticism or um, theology even? Um, regarding uh, Malabu's question, what is your opinion with regards to the type of negotiating that could take place? And um, yeah, that's about that.